Welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. My name is Dina Freeman Patton. I'm the Vice President and Director of Athletics at Morgan State University. Leadership is developing more leaders. The NCAA Pathway Program is a program to help develop uh, leaders into athletics directors. And I got my first athletics director job while I was in the midst of Pathway Program. And then I got my second athletics director job at Morgan State University with the help of the Leadership Development Program. And the things that I learned in this program, which included um, how to work with staff and develop your staff, how to motivate them, also encourage them to participate in these programs that are available to them throughout this process. As an athletics director, I encourage all other athletics directors to nominate your staff to participate in leadership development programs. Greetings, this is Ty Brown, and welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review One Question Leadership Podcast wherever you are listening to this podcast. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at One Q Leadership. Today's episode will be hosted by Dr. Monique Carroll. Dr. Carroll is the Vice President and Director of Intercollegiate Athletics at Chicago State. Take it away, Monique. Welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. My name is Dr. Monique Carroll. I'm the Athletic Director at Chicago State University. And I have with me today, Janelle White, sitting AD at Point University, who's had stops at Alabama State, IUPUI. And we're just going to dive right into it, talking a little about leadership, life, college sports. Uh, we're here at the Women Leaders Convention, Women Leaders in Sports Convention in New Orleans. So nice to have you, Jim. Thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. Yes. I'm excited to be here with you. Nice. Um, so a lot of people like to talk about leadership, mentorship. Tell me what that's done for you and your career and what that really means to you. Yeah. So, you know, I would not be in this chair without the mentorship. Um, I was one that would seek it out. You know, I would go sit in senior associate ADs or deputies offices when I was a compliance coordinator, just wanting to pick their brain and learn as much as I could. And I would often ask them about their leadership philosophy. You know, why do you do what you do? And so having opportunities to meet with those individuals with all the stops that I've been, I mean, I'm, I've worked at six institutions. So and actually at my seventh. Um, so there was a ton of resources and gems and nuggets that I was able to pick pick up from the people that have been doing it for a long time and also doing it the right way. You know, you got to make sure you're you're picking the brains of the individuals that are doing it the right way. And I was fortunate enough to um, have that opportunity to do that. Yeah. One thing you mentioned there, you said you would, you would pick others' brains about why they did what they do. Why do you do what you do? Absolutely. I think it stems from being a student athlete. Um, I tell people I was literally born into Division One athletics. My father was a track and field coach. So it has been my life. Um, I didn't think I was going to work in college athletics, but when I was given the opportunity at Auburn to step into a graduate assistant role, I was like, man, this is, okay, this is pretty cool. You know, people see the glitz and the glam and they see the the shoes and 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 the gear, but there's so much more to it. You know, you you have the opportunity to really help young people develop. And that's why I do what I do. I feel it's my responsibility to help people become the best versions of themselves. Nice. Uh, so definitely as a former volleyball athlete myself, uh, you talk about watching people, uh, watching from afar. Uh, you one of those people uh, that I have my eyes on for a long time. Uh, what advice would you give to young professionals in the field coming up um, that, that do watch from the sidelines? Is that a good place to be? When should they approach? Uh, how should they make those relationships uh, and make them strategically so they can be sitting in a space like this one day? Absolutely. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I was thinking, about, I feel like we, we've grown up together, Monique, yes. um, in this in this business and have the chance to be in the same conference and spaces. But yes, I think watching from afar is one of the best ways to do it. I did that. You know, I, I would, as we say now, Google stock people, you know, um, and it's okay to do that. You want to you want to learn about them before you go up and approach them. Because like I said before, you want to make sure you're following the right people. You want to make sure you're emulating the right ones. And so I think that's the best way. How are they moving? What are they doing at conferences? What are they saying? You know, are, are other people following them? You know, 
um, all those keys. And you can learn a lot by just watching and, and listening and paying attention. As my husband used to say, it doesn't cost much, doesn't cost you a thing to pay attention. And so in doing so, you'll pick up so many different uh, valuables and gems and, and nuggets, like I said before. All right. Uh, so you talked about paying attention. So I'll say one of the things I pay attention to a lot is how people dress, uh, especially on game day. You know, you have to have your own authentic style, uh, but you definitely, you know, you don't want to look, you know, what, what what are the other industry people that I have my own? What are they doing? Uh, who would you say is your style icon in, in or out of athletics? It doesn't, no pressure. Okay. That's, ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, you know, times have changed. And I think about just this convention and we're talking about heat on your feet. I'm getting so many compliments and um, just just uh, posts and messages from friends saying, Janelle, we've never seen you in tennis shoes before. Like, I think we like this side of you. And so watching different, you know, the first person that comes to mind is Tamika Smith-Jones. I think I love how she dresses. Um, Dr. Christine Kelly, you know, she's on the sideline, get to watch her videos and she's got her tennis shoes on and still has her jacket and, 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 and her slacks on. You want to be comfortable. You want to be stylish, but you also want to make sure that you're representing the university and your department and your student athletes are paying attention. I think um, Dr. Karen Lee told me her student athletes told her she needed to step her her shoe game up. Right. So it, it, they're paying attention and they're watching and and they want us to be cool and hip and we want to be cool at that cool hip AD as well. So a couple different people there. But I, I can honestly say I'm OK to put the heels in the closet. I'm, I'm good with the Cole Hans or the Nikes or the Adidas, whatever the case may be, um, being comfortable, but still leading, leading in style. Gotcha. Le- leading in style. That, that, that may be a new tagline. <laughs> Um, so a, a, a lot of this I see that I observe, you know, heat on the feet, uh, a little more relaxed culture has really came on the heels of the COVID pandemic. Uh, can you talk about leading um, through that? And then now that we're on the other side, uh, maybe any any positives that really came out of uh, the COVID pandemic? Right. Oh, leading through the pandemic. I, I, I don't know how we made it through, but we did. And that's the exciting part. We did make it through. Mm -hmm. The things that we probably thought we wouldn't be able to do, our uh, assignments wouldn't get done, projects wouldn't get finished. Everything got done and everything got finished. And people seemed to be a little bit happier uh, when they were at home. Now, it could be chaotic. You know, you often had a kid running on screen or, Mm -hmm. you know, you hear someone in the background, mommy, I can't get on. Um, So it was a lot of things that we had to work through but we persevered and we did it. And so one of the things that I probably brought back from that is everyone doesn't have to be in the office all the time. I allow flexibility in my office. If you've been at the gym or the field until midnight, there's no need for you to be in the office at eight o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning. No, stay at home, take care of your business and then come in and let's do it all over again. It's about trust. You got to trust your employees, got to trust your workers that they're getting the job done. I feel like mine are doing that, but allowing that flexibility, that's that's what COVID showed us. We can be flexible, we can still get the job done and possibly do it even better. Yeah, gee. Uh, so when you talk about trust, uh, there, there are two kind of people, maybe a third or fourth have popped up, but two of the main ones, you either come in the door and you trust everyone or you sit back and they really have to earn your trust. Which, which one are you and how has that worked for you at Point University? I think I'm I'm a combination of both. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to I'm I'm going to trust some folks and then I'm going to pay attention to some others and I feel like the good Lord has blessed me with discernment and so that's one thing that I have been able to take with me everywhere I've been in this, but it's it's very effective now in the in the chair because I have to ask additional questions or I have to sit back and watch individuals or you know give them something okay let me see how they handle that. Can they get it done? What's what's the timing look like? Um, I'm very big on people operating in their strengths. So I had to have a lot of one-on-one meetings. Talk to me about this. Why why are you here? Why are you doing this? And where do you want to go? Because I want to set you up for success. When you're happy, everybody else is happy and things flow and move. And we take care of the student athletes like we like we should be doing because they are our number one priority. So I'm I'm a little bit of a combination of both, but trust is very important. And I shared that with my staff in a meeting. You know, if I can't trust you, you can't work for me. Mm-hmm. And that's just what it is. 
Yeah, very good. So you talk about uh, being a former student athlete, uh, lead, now leading student athletes. How do you stay connected uh, to the student athletes? One of the things I've kind of noticed, the further you get, the further you ascend to the chair, um, you're going to be really intentional uh, about making those. Like, what are some things that have worked for you? How do you really keep a pulse on what the student athletes are experiencing? You hit the nail on the head when you said intentional. That is it. You have to be intentional. When I see them, I... um because I sit on the president's leadership cabinet, I had an office over there in our main academic building. And at the time I had an office in the gym as well. Well, I moved my office full time over to the academic building for a couple of reasons. One, to be with, with my colleagues in the senior leadership, but also so I can see the student athletes when they're walking through the halls. And I get to shake their hands or give them, you know, give them a pound or give them a hug even, you know, tell them congratulations or great game or what have you. And I think that makes a difference. Um, showing up, you know, being present. Um, I, I don't try to meet with them a whole lot. I meet with my SAT group um, and I'll try to make sure just walking around or in different spaces. I've, you know, on the NAIA level, I can do things for my student athletes and not get in trouble for it. So I think about it was, a, it was a group of young ladies. They were walking downtown and they wanted to go get ice cream. Well, I cash out them some money so they could go get ice cream. So it's just those little things. I remember being a broke college student mm -hmm. and wanting yeah. some money. So, you know, something so I can do something simple as, you know, purchasing some ice cream. And that's something that they'll remember and appreciate. But it's just those little things, paying attention to the little details when when they're going through something, sending I send them an email or if I happen to have their contact information, I'll send them a note. Hey, it's going to be OK. I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. All those things matter. Yeah, you definitely they matter. And and you made a good point uh, in in a in in AI, you could definitely have a little more flexibility when it comes to uh, taking care of the student athletes. Um, that's a fact uh, from experiencing that. Um, so talk about uh, being when you were at NCAA institutions, uh, what really sold you on Point University? Uh, what made you make that transition in, in an industry where everyone's trying to, you know, maybe everyone's trying to be a Power 5 AD? Uh, you know, taking that what some people may say is a step back, but I mean, I've been watching everything you're doing there and it's definitely a huge step up. So talk a little bit about the decision to make that kind of transition in your career. Absolutely. It was both a personal and professional decision. Um, at the time, my husband and I, we were wanting to get back closer to family. And I had made the decision that I was ready to sit in the chair. You know, people have been telling me for quite some time, Janelle, you're ready. You need to go on and do it. Um, I was somewhat reluctant, you know, having four kids. At that time, I had a husband who was in the business as well. It was just crazy. But I happened to see the retirement announcement of the previous athletic director. And I said, Point University, where is this? So again, you jump on, jump on the internet real quick, Google it. And I said, oh my goodness, it's 30 minutes from Auburn where I went to school. You know, it's right on 85 and we're from Atlanta. This is perfect location because my family's in Birmingham and uh, my in-laws are in Theodore, Alabama, which is close to Mobile. And so I was like, wow, this is small, private Christian institution. My faith is very important to me. So that aligned, you know, it's an opportunity and it gets us, you know, closer to family, gets the kids closer to their cousins and things. And so it was a no brainer. Once I, I, I sat back and I watched to see if they were going to post the position. I saw the posting and I applied and I didn't know anybody and come to find out uh, I was I was the senior associate AD at IUPUI, a gentleman who works in the IU system at another institution. <laughs> he reaches out to me and says, Janelle, did you know that I was the first AD at Point University? And wow. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, small world. <laughs> Very small world. And so we're, we're on a um, IU ADs meeting and he said, oh, Janelle, I knew you were getting the job before you did. And so it's just... That small world, that small community, it goes goes back to you never know who's watching. You know, it's not what you know who you know or who knows you. Um, but it it felt right. Um, and talking to family and friends and and colleagues and mentors, you know, that they're like Janelle, this is the one for you. I had I had tried, I had applied for D one positions and and I think a D three position and it didn't work out. It's so it's the hustle and, and the bustle. A lot of people are applying for the same positions. Um, 
you feel like you're the, the best person for the job, but you end up not being so. And so I don't consider it a step backwards at all. I think sitting in the chair is sitting in the chair. I'm learning how to do a lot with with a little. And so um, building that skill set and continuing to build my toolbox, um, it's been beneficial for me. And I, I think about you, you know, you were in the NAIA space and now you're at D1 Institution at the university. So talk talk to us about your transition. Uh, I, I think kind of similar. You you kind of look and and I was not I, and I say this at every stop and I do I do mean it. Uh, you get in and you really work. Uh, one one of the things I've embraced is just being a transformative leader. Uh, I don't know how well I would do just stepping into something where I have to do what the last ten people did, uh, where there's no creativity, innovation. Uh, in a role like that. So that had a big uh, thing to do. And then a presidential transition. I was settled in, you know, my home state of Texas. And uh, it, it made me open uh, to talking with others. And then uh, President Scott, uh, she's a closer. <laughs> and and uh, I went on a visit uh, first time in Chicago in years and, and closed it. So I think uh, fit. And then that was kind of the, the next direction. Uh, to me, fit is super important. How do you develop that with staff? You talk about how you got to Point University and it, it seemed like it checked every box uh, that you had. I know in hiring, you try to check all the boxes. Uh, so can you talk just a little bit about, you know, how you lead those processes and, and what that looks like to get a good fit uh, to work for you? You know, it's funny because I used to hate that word fit, <laughs> but it's but it but it's true. And I I involve my staff. I'm not while I make the decision at the end of the day, I want their input because they're probably going to be working with that individual more than I am. And so I'll pull in my senior. Um, well, she's my assistant AD, senior woman leader. I have uh, my my director of field house, field house operations. I'll pull him in, and, and 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 even another staff person, and sometimes a coach, depending upon you know what I'm looking for, because I I value their opinions and I want them to feel valued. You know, people buy in when they feel like they've had a little bit of a say so um, in what you're doing, and so. I look at it from one perspective, but they may look at it from another perspective and making sure that we're asking the right questions, you know, at a, at our small Christian institution, y- you have to know Jesus, you know? Mm. And so that was a, a, a change for me because I'm used to HR, you know, I can't, you know, state institutions, you can't ask those questions, but I'm now at, at an institution where I can ask that question and it's very important. And so just keying in and and letting um, my staff be involved because it's helping them grow as well. I hope that they want to sit in the seat one day. Um, and so I want to make sure that they have the opportunities to be a part of it. But you're right, fit, fit is important. And Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes said yesterday, when you're hiring somebody, take your time. It's okay to go slow. So you make sure that you get the right person. And and we've done that. We've been very diligent. We've been, we've paused, we prayed, you know, all those things. And so far, so good. So far, so good. So you talked a little bit about take, taking a step back sometimes, pausing sometimes. If you can reflect uh, the whole your entire career, uh, what are some things that you would pass on to someone uh, like listening to this podcast now uh, about a mistake uh, that you made that you that you would want to share the message? Uh, you know, don't do it. Like avoid you know the next person up from doing the same thing. You know, I, I had a hiring mistake. Um, and I thought I was being diligent. I thought I had asked the right questions and tapped into the right resources and come to find out I didn't. And I think when we celebrate those failures, if you will, um, look at them as learning opportunities. I know what I will do differently. Uh, the next time I have a few extra questions that I ask, I learned a lot from that hire. And I beat myself up a little bit in the beginning, but I had to pause and say, you know what, it's part of it. You're not going to, you know, if I'm I'm batting a thousand all the time, you know, something might be wrong. So I was okay with that, with that miss because I brought my staff back in. What? And I asked them like, what, what, did, did we do this the right way? You know, did, did we miss a question? How did this happen? And you know, sometimes they, people show you who they are in the interview and they might change and be, you know, someone else. So it's okay. Take your time, relax, learn from it, and just do better the next time. 
Yeah, so so that's that's a big one, a hiring, uh, and and you you hit the nail on the head. You, if you're batting a thousand, is, is that really good? <laughs> right. uh, you know, er, early in my career, that was the case. I said, hey, I've, all my hires have been awesome, and I got to that point. It was like, okay, that maybe not. You know, it just didn't work out. You <laughs> right. know, for for everyone's best efforts uh, in the situation, fit. You know, the our, the big popular word. Uh, may may have happened. Uh, so I'm gonna transition a little bit, talk a little a little volleyball. <laughs> Let's uh, do it. <laughs> so uh, amazing student athlete at Auburn. Uh, I think that was one of the first things when I read your bio you know, years ago uh, that stuck out. Obviously, as a volleyball student athlete. Um, and so talk about the experience that you had there, uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about being the student athlete at that level, what you try to bring to Point University every day so they can just have uh, not even a taste, because I think it can be the same. It may just look different. Talk, talk a little about that. That's it, man. I had, I, I'm getting goosebumps. I, I had an amazing experience at Auburn University as a volleyball student athlete. And I tell my student athletes, if someone told me I could go back, I'm going back immediately. So uh, it was just that good. And, and I went through three coaches. You know, a lot of people don't wouldn't want to go back and go through three coaches, but I learned so much about personalities, how to work with different people. Um, you know, it was just, those are some skills and transferable skills that I that I have brought with me throughout my career and definitely now in the chair. And I think it's just that elite mentality. I have an elite mentality. I When I stood in front of the entire staff, the athletic department, and did my little first meeting, I told them I do not know how to be mediocre. And they all just looked at me and I was like, yeah. So if that's you, I'll tell you right now, we're not going to work well together. Um, You don't have to be at a power five division one institution to have an elite mentality. You don't have to be at a division two institution to do things the right way. Yes, we are small Christian NAI school and we can be just as elite as we want to be. And again, it goes back to that buy-in. Of course, they're looking at me kind of crazy, like, is this is this lady? Oh, Lord, you know, what's happening? And I think some rumor was going around through the coaches. You know, she's come from a division, you know, all her life she's been a division one institution. She's coming in, she's firing everybody. And no, you right. know, take a breath. That's not what this is. But I did set set my standards, you know, and, and my non-negotiables. We put that out there. On day one. So they knew kind of who I was and what I was about. And I said, we're going to work together. We're going to partner. This is a team. You all have your individual teams, but we are a team. You know, Point Skyhawks Athletic Department, we are one big team and we need everybody. And I want and I value their input. I want this to be not just Janelle's thing, but it's our thing. It's 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 definitely not an I, it's a we. So um, taking you know, I've been on teams all my life. And so taking a lot of those things that I learned on those teams, working with my, 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 my teammates, um, has transitioned over to my new teammates now. Nice. All right. So you talk about elite mindset. What's one thing you do not on the job to really, uh, continue to master that elite mindset? Oh, read. You know, Hattie says all the time, readers are leaders, (laughs) our leaders are readers, (laughs) whichever way you go. Uh, I haven't done it as much as I used to, but I'm starting to get back in that flow. I love to read different books, whether it's on leadership or whether it's just something fun, you know, somebody's autobiography or a mystery of some kind. But just keeping my mind going and thinking about what's next, continuing to think outside the box, because that's what we have to do at this level. We got to get creative. Sometimes the money isn't always there. So what resources do I have to tap into? What did this person, you know, how did how did they grow? What did I learn from this book? Uh, what leadership tip can I take and, and implement in, into my staff or to the coaches or whatnot? So I do a lot of reading to to stay lead, listen to podcasts. Uh, this is one of my favorite podcasts to listen to, uh, listen to Women Leaders podcasts to just pull different things from other people. But that's how I keep that elite mentality. All right. Uh, so you talked about reading. What What's a book that you would recommend uh, to the listeners uh, give give us maybe a short a short read. I'm I'm one of those that mm-hmm. I, I used to love the the long books, hundred two hundred pages. Now you can't send a duck to Eagle School or something <laughs> short. It's it's something I can manage with with my schedule. Uh, what's a book you would recommend to the listeners? You know, Who Moved My Cheese will never get old. Uh, that's a good one. Chopwood Carry Water. Now, 
Y'all have to forgive me because the author just slipped my my mind. But that was a really, it's a quick read, but it's a really, really good read. And that's the one that I gave to my entire staff. They all read it. And I think when they got it, they were thinking, what is this? We got to read now? What is she What is, what is she doing to us? But it, it was funny, the reaction that I received when we did our retreat. They were like, man, we were reluctant at first to read this book, but we're so thankful that you gave it to us because this there's tips in here that we can implement in our teams. You know, we're going to read this to the student athletes and so on and so forth. So they were reluctant at first and I was kind of hesitant to see, you know, what they were going to say. But I told them, I'm not doing my job if I'm not pushing you outside your comfort zone. So yes, we can all read, you know, you you all may, it may not be your thing, but this book right here is short enough, quick enough. And I believe it has the the tips inside that you're really going to enjoy. And sure enough, that's what they did. Yeah, it just sounds like it may have not have been their thing. You made it our thing as, it. as the athletic department. So, Janelle, thank you so much uh, just for joining me for our conversation today. Uh, it's been a pleasure sitting down talking with you. Any last thing you want to sign off and leave the listeners with? You know, this this industry is awesome. Um, it's continuing to grow. We're, we're ready to grow together. And if you're in it, just remember your why and stay focused on your life. Hachi, thank you. Thank you. Once again, this is Dr. Monique Carroll, Athletic Director at Chicago State. Had the chance to sit with Janelle White, the Athletic Director at Point University. Thank you for listening today. This episode of the One Question Leadership Podcast is produced by Spades Media Group, solving problems using creative leadership.